Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim. Today, we're discussing the great state of Georgia's children and families with our special guests, Juanita Stedman, Executive Director of Together Georgia, and Gwen Skinner, Vice President of Operations of Devereaux in Georgia. So thank you both for joining us. I'm so excited to hear a little bit more about Together Georgia and Devereaux. It's great to have you. Thank you. We're excited to be here too. Thank Very you. Very happy. So um, let's let's start with you, Juanita. Uh, okay. Tell us a little bit about Together Georgia. First of all, I love the name. Together. Thank you. Thank you. Right. We should be taking care of our children together. Our children are our future, and it really, you know, when you're a teacher and you see all those those kids in in your class, you take this this idea of educating and creating community. Shouldn't we all be doing that? Shouldn't we all be the teachers and the caretakers of our of our children? And how do you at Together Georgia come together to do actually just that? I absolutely think that's true. I often say, and I've said it in many a meeting, legislative meetings, other meetings, Gwen's heard me say this, these are our children. And our is a big word when you're talking about these children. They belong to all of us. And I think that we're very guilty as a community and a society of thinking that the children that we work with are just the children of in Georgia is called the Department of Family and Children's Services of the child welfare system. And we forget that it's they're not just their children. And we say that because they're the ones who have to take custody of these children. But they're also the children of the Department of Mental Health. They're also the children of the Department of Community Health. They're also the children of the churches in your community. They're the children of the schools in your community, and they really do have to work together. We have recently, uh, just in the last few months during the summer, we went around to the state. We intend to do this more, and we've done this program called Better Together. And Better Together was where we went into communities that didn't have what the metropolitan Atlanta area had. And we go into those communities And we invited everybody. We invited the courts. We invited the churches. We invited every nonprofit we could get our hands on. We invited the Department of Family and Children's Services, who we worked in partnership with. And so we truly invited all of these people and said, okay, what are the issues in your community? Most of them were the same in all three of those communities, housing, transportation, jobs, everything you would think they would be. But what we said to them was, how do you do this in your community? And and one of the things that I felt very passionate about was teaching a community about the resources they have in their community. I say to them, and, and Gwen knows this about me, I used churches when I was a juvenile court judge. I mean, I, you know, I used churches. They did dinners. They did Christmas. They did a lot of different things. And that's a whole population of people who are just waiting for you to ask them to do something. You know what? So what you're we- saying, what you're saying, uh, Juanita, is that these children, these children who are white and black and Asian and Latin Hispanic, these children who are disabled, who are from rural areas and urban areas, these children who have different needs. And have different experiences. There are children, isn't that right, Gwen? They are our children, and I think one of the things that Together Georgia and Juanita have uh, successfully done is to bring the community to the table. And at the same time, many times there's an adversarial relationship with the state agencies that manage these um, children as they come through the various systems. And I think we've been successful in Georgia at developing some very strong working relationships with the agencies and among the providers. It's not a competition. We're working together to meet the needs of the children. Right. So I I find it interesting. Your background, um, Juanita, is is from the law, legal system. Mm -hmm. Gwen, talk a little bit about your, your background. 
I spent 25 years within the Department of Juvenile Justice, which I loved. I said, I know people find it. I loved every day that I worked in that agency. And I left there to become the director of mental health, developmental disabilities, and addictive diseases in Georgia, which was a real eye opener for me um, to go into that arena and then retired from there and came to work for Devro because they shared very similar values that I had. But I guess what I'm most proud of is I was a foster parent, my husband and I, for many years. And so uh, just a varied, a varied background working with Georgia's children. Talk a little bit, if you if you both don't mind, about this idea of the people who serve, like yourselves, are being served. Talk a little bit about that, that idea of service being so meaningful to our own personal lives. Uh, Juanita, you want to you want to give give that a shot? You know, I now believe that I serve the the folks who are doing the hard work, like the Gwens of the world. The people who are out there, the agencies who are having to really get this work done, sometimes in not great circumstances. I mean, sometimes just in in a way that they do it every day and they do it with such a heart. And I believe my role is to represent them and to, to kind of fight for them, to be willing to go to state agencies and say, this is what they need and here is why they need it. And that takes opening up those conversations and making sure that they trust you, you trust them. I can do that. I can say those things. I don't have a contract with them. I don't have to worry about them being mad at me. I think there are times they're mad at me. They know there are times I'm mad at them. But, you know, I think that making sure everyone understands that these are really folks with a true servant's heart. You know, they do this because they believe in it. The Gwen Skinners of the world and Gwen could do anything she wanted to. She's smart. She's wise. She's all of those things. She could be doing something much easier than what just today we were trying to do. And that's there's some kids in hotels again in Georgia, just a few, but trying to find those kids a placement. Uh, And what Gwen does, and so many of these folks do, is they really look at it in in a wide range. You know, they don't look at it in just what's good for my agency and how much money are we going to get. They look at it in how do we all do this together, as Gwen was saying. And and that's that's just a privilege. I mean, for me, it's a privilege. It's a completely different side than what I used to be on. You know, I used to be mad at all of them. You know, now I understand <laughs> I should have not ever been mad. She made our lives miserable. <laughs> she did. <laughs> You know, and I and now I realize that when I was mad, I, I had no concept of what they had to do to get the things I was asking for on the bench. You know, I had no concept that maybe there was an insurance that was going to pay for it. I mean, I had that typical kind of judge belief that, well, this is what's right and we've all agreed to it. So make it happen. Um, I see them make it happen every day. Um, I hear the stories every day of of children that they've truly changed their life. There's a, a, I guess he's a young man, Hank, I don't know, he's in his 40s, who came back and found Gwen, who graduated out of the prison high school, who now is a very successful African-American man who's worked in the railroad system who we now use to speak at things. And he talks about the fact that Gwen answered a letter of this, that simple thing of her responding to him when he said, I'm going to get out of here. I don't want to go back to the gang embedded community. I came from somebody needs to help me. And Gwen was in a very high position and he would have never imagined. And she took that time. And I, you know, I see that. I'm in all of that. Uh, I believe that, you know, together we're all making changes. 
I don't think they get enough credit for it. You know, what you get credit for is when something bad happens. You know, that's so let's, paper. Let's, let's talk a little bit about when about Devereaux and the various services that you provide. That would be just great if you could just unpack those. And then let's talk a little bit about Together Georgia. Um, and then let's talk about what we need to be doing in the future as a country, as a state, as a state of Georgia, but also what we need to be do, doing as a country. But Gwen, tell us a little bit about the, 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 the range of different um, services that are provided by Devereaux. Well, you know, well, let me give my, my plug for foster care while we're, while we're talking about it. You know, so many people say, I can't do foster care or I won't do foster care because I just couldn't stand to have a child come and live with me and then leave. And I think one of the greatest joys is taking a child who's had trauma in their life, who has had um, situations in their family that necessitated their removal and getting them to a place where they can go back with their families. I think that is some of the most rewarding work that that we can do. And I always tell people, I think fostering is one of the most positive things I have ever done in my career um, above anything else. Why I came to work for Devereaux, and Devereaux is a very large organization. We're in 11 different states, but we do very different things in each of those states. And in Georgia, one of the reasons that I came to work for Devereaux is, first of all, their standard is, would you put your family member in, in a program here, in the treatment program here? And one of the agreements we had is that I would be able to develop programs that would meet the needs of Devereaux's of Georgia's children. And so we have developed a program, which is why Juanita and I are often in conversation and why I'm in conversation with the Department of Juvenile Justice, as well as Department of Family and Children's Services, to take children who have been unsuccessful in other placements. And so it really does not detour our staff if you've been in 25 foster homes or if you've been in other psychiatric treatment programs. And Devereaux has let us grow this very unique program. And now we get children. We commit to serve predominantly Georgia's children, but we get children from all over the country from the tribes, um, California's departments of education places children here from the islands. So it's very much a needed service. And we're fortunate that Devereaux has a presence in Georgia. Uh, would you like to comment, Juanita, in terms of your approach? Because you refer to yourself as being the strict judge from the bench. And you've, you've had this sort of eye-opening experience since you took this new role. Well, I was a strict judge, but I also did two accountability courts. I did a family accountability court and a juvenile accountability court. And while you're strict in those, you also get to do that whole child, whole family thing. My teams, you know, were 12 and 15 people with therapists and everybody. And, you know, we worked with that whole family. But, you know, I want to say about Gwen, the thing that, that I know, um, when we get these complex kids, and I don't think people understood when they first started talking about complex kids, what that really meant. I think the lay person thought, oh, it's some teenager acting out. Now, you have a 16-year-old, nonverbal, severely autistic, wears a diaper, so he's not potty trained. He's never spoken. He was found handcuffed to a bed. And now he's in foster care and you're trying to find a placement for him because of his IQ. He went to another Together Georgia member. But Gwen is the one often and she knows this. I'll just send her a kid that I get or she'll send me one that she hears that we get from the state to look at and say, where can we place them? Where can we put them and and help them? 
not have another disruption when some of those children have been in 25 placements. And who can imagine, not any of us, what it means for 25 times for you to be told you're not good enough. You don't fit here. You're not good enough. And so Gwen is really the person, and I've seen her do it with her staff, that says, this is our mission. You know, this is what we're going to do. And we're going to do everything we can to work with those children. So that's a huge gift to the state. Because at one point, we had 78 kids in hotels at the cost of $17 million a year. So I, I just I think she just gets a lot of credit for that. I think for me, I was tough on the bench. I probably was tougher on the staff and the adults than I sometimes otherwise was. I had high expectations, absolutely. But one of the things that I immediately learned when I came to this side was um, we have a lobbyist who calls me a recovering judge. And I think that's probably the right thing to say is that how much bureaucracy goes on just to get children the services that they need. And I think Georgia with their mental health commission and the things are really trying to look at that in a different way. Um, and that's refreshing. You know, that I, I want to ask you about, about the bureaucracy, both of you, because I was part of that bureaucracy when I was with the child welfare administration, city of New York, so tuition payments, foster care payments, um, the 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 uh, treatment investigations, just to investigate a a protective uh, uh, issue where uh, there's a report of abuse or neglect, right? All that has to be tracked. When I came in to New York, it was a shambles. It was it was just an absolute disaster. And I was always very, very concerned about the trade-off between tracking information and creating an onerous bureaucracy, right? So in order to get paid, you have to have some bureaucracy, you have to have some workflow, you have to have some evidence that services were provided. How did you, how do you experience that trade-off? Do you think that the state of Georgia um, has been able to evolve to a correct balance or is it still too much or is it the kind of thing where there's no perfect answer it's like that there are systems but there are also people and people have to grease the wheels a little bit in the best possible sense of just figuring out when we have to do strict adherence and we also have to be a little bit more flexible when why don't you why don't you give it give it a, a your first take in the state of georgia do, do you have a good balance or are you too bureaucratic it probably depends on what day you ask me that question. Um, having been on both sides of, of this, I think that we have a good balance. You know, when you're operating a state agency and you're responsible for lives, the very well-being, people are going to hold me accountable. I feel accountable you know, how much is too much when, when you're trying to protect really vulnerable, vulnerable individuals that is, as I say all the time, they've had enough. By the time they get to us, they have had enough. Um, I think that people have to recognize, I often make this analogy, is that sometimes when you're dealing with large numbers of people, that things happen that, that that shouldn't happen and you have to be investigated and there has there has to be watch care what when i think it's too much is when you look at people like residential treatment providers and you make this assumption that they are that's not a positive place for children to be. If something negative happens in the public school system, you deal with it from a personnel perspective, from an operational perspective. You don't shut the school system down. So I think sometimes we lose that understanding and we shut down good providers 
when it's really what they need to do is correct whatever mistake has been made. So, Juanita, do you think that Gwen is basically saying that a, a little bit of common sense is required to keep things going, right? A little bit of discussion? I, I think so. And I think we've gotten better at that. We now have regular meetings with the agency where we bring to them, started during COVID, when COVID first happened and none of us knew what we were doing. I said, I'm going to meet with my people on Monday. Can we send you the questions they ask? And will you meet with us on Friday? And they did. And we ha probably have 100, sometimes more than 100 people on those calls. It's now gone to bi-monthly. It's every other month. So I think that helping, you know, the agency can become very, first of all, most of those people in there have never run a private agency. They've never been out in the field and they've been given what they're supposed to do when they very much are going to do what they're supposed to do. But I think we've worked at, you know, talking about these things and looking at these things. I was on a call for an hour today because I have a group of providers who treat very complex kids, medically fragile, you know, very complex, and they're not getting paid, you know, and they're owed two and three hundred thousand dollars for one child because there's a, a glitch in this one system. So we talked and we talked and I finally said, could we not just get a group of you, state of Georgia agency folks, together with my people who are doing it and using these systems on this side, a regular meeting and just talk about how we can work through those things to get them done. So I think we do better at that. I think sometimes one of the things I found when I first came in was a, a group of providers who were just mad. They were mad at the, at the Department of Family and Children's Services. They didn't want to do these things. And why did they have to do these things? And I had to be very blunt with them and say, because you have a contract with them. And, and, the, and these regs often come down from somewhere else. So one of the things that Georgia is very fortunate in, and when I am at my national meetings, you don't hear this, and Gwen can probably talk about it in the other states she's in. We can pick up the phone and call our leadership on their cell phones. You know, something happens, we can have immediate access. And I think that has come from developing a trust and a real partnership and, and maintaining that partnership. Gwen and I both have gone to bat for the agency when they've been really being beaten up and written letters saying, look, you know, this isn't just a Department of Family and Children's Services issue. You know, this is an issue that we're dealing with as a state. So I think there's that trust and that really having a seat at the table. So you're talking about giving everybody a seat? Yes. You're talking about, uh, Juanita, about communication? Yes. You're talking about, and, and, and Gwen, I think you imply this as well, you got to kind of give each other a break. Yes. Yes. Right? Yes. You know, and, and just say, okay. And you also have to al allow a little bit of room even if you have a strongly held belief and you listen to somebody else's opposite belief, you have to have a little bit of self-doubt, you know, maybe, okay, yeah. if you try this that I'm suggesting, I'll try this that you're suggesting. You might not agree with the thing that I'm suggesting and I might not agree with the thing, that, but let's, let's try it out. Sometimes you actually find, my God, I might've been wrong. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's true. <laughs> And I think we've evolved into that. That wasn't the way it was. And I think uh, we've evolved into trusting each other enough to try each other's things out. I mean, don't you, Gwen? I feel like we are getting there or are there. I do. In, in many ways, I think that we probably are further down that road because I, I have responsibility for Devereaux's children's programs, all of their children's programs. So I'm in multiple states. I think the openness that we share here and the relationships that we have with the agencies here are very positive and have helped us to address problems like 
hoteling, trying not to place children out of state for treatment, if there's any way at all that we can provide that treatment in state for them to keep them close to their family and community. So um, it, we say in Georgia, relationships are everything. Yeah. Well, let's, t- let, let's talk about this because we're coming to the end of our time. But, but I think that that particular topic that you raised, Gwen, and that you previously raised, Juanita, the whole idea of relationships, and also in terms of how do you shape, be, before we were talking, we were talking about the fact that to hire a really effective leader, you're talking about a, a combination of competencies, you know, technical competencies to provide foster care or fundraising or navigating uh, compliance regulation with the state. So those are technical competencies. But then there's also something else. Mm-hmm. The relationship side, and it's not performative. It's not fake. It's not somebody making a brilliant speech, right? In fact, the best person to relationship might not be the best person to make a brilliant speech. Could you could you each talk as we as 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 we're coming to a close here, uh, Gwen? Why don't you start, and then Juanita, you can take us out in terms of the importance of people, and and having the right combination of people forge those relationships that that are the things that that make these organizations work when uh, talk a little bit about how you bring people on board and what you're looking for well it actually relates to what you said mark which is that people have to be open to the idea that someone may have a better idea or a different twist on how to do something that you can use But I've seen some very powerful leaders in my day that could not form the relationships with the providers. I've seen providers who've had leadership, to your point, that were absolutely unable to have relationships among other providers or with state agency heads. And I think what you're looking for, you have to have all those skill sets. You're not going to survive long if you don't have financial acumen. You're not going to survive long if you can't develop an understanding of rules and regulations and and how to, what data you need to watch and all of those technical aspects. But at the end of the day, We're dealing with children, we're dealing with families, we're dealing with human beings, we're dealing with very human situations, and people want to be heard and know that you care. And in my world, that their child is as important as my child is to me. And that's what, those are the people that I want to hire. And we say often, At Devereaux, people come to work here in Georgia specifically, and they think they're coming to work at a group home. And we have to tell them, this isn't a group home. This is a psychiatric treatment facility for the most complex kids, some of the most complex kids in the country. Mm -hmm. And half of you will be here in six months. The other half will be gone because it's too intense. I'm looking for that half of the people that have that kind of commitment and that kind of heart for these children. So there's a toughness that goes with your compassion, Gwen. Mm-hmm. Right, 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 Juanita. I mean, that, there's, that, there's that combination, isn't it? That That's the thing that I find to be so amazing right it's the it's the toughness it's the objectivity it's the competence it's the empathy they kind of all coexist and aren't they battling all all the time we can never allow one side to win because if we become totally focused on workflow excellence we forget the empathy you know if we if we only focus on empathy maybe we're we're financially we tip over Right. And and I can honestly say, because I am retired and I came back from retirement to do this, 
is I have never on any day felt like Devereaux was more concerned about money than they were about the children that I had in treatment, not on a single day. That is that is just wonderful. Juanita, you want to take us out and just tell us what you think we should be doing to continue to improve this, to continue to strengthen the services that are provided throughout Georgia for our, our children. Well, I, well, I will talk about relationships. I think that's the only reason I was hired because I had absolutely no knowledge base of what these folks did. And, and relationships have always been important to me. They're important to Gwen. We have legislators that we meet with regularly. We take them to lunch. We talk to them. We, you know, about things that, and one of them in particular was on a, on my phone in my car and he said well if my girls and he was talking about Gwen and me and our lobbyists Helen tell me to do that I'll do it and my husband said to me do you not mind him calling you his girl and I said not at all we're good but I think that that is very important for somebody in my kind of position is to be able to bring those people together and and work with them but I think that's the key of what's going to make us successful in Georgia. We have for years, and Gwen and I have been doing this a long, long time, worked in silos. And the people over in mental health didn't know what the people over here were doing. We're all talking about the same kid, but we have three different agencies that are requiring three different things. or All of them are requiring the same thing, but you have to do all those regs over again. Right. It drove me crazy when I first came on board because I was like, this makes no sense. So I think the one thing is to open up and to talk about these children in a way that we look at them as, as whole children. And, and one of the things that's happening, and I keep telling our members this, is that for a long, long time, what's called MWO, a really tough, tough kid to have, maximum watchful oversight. These were kids that were, quote, bad kids. These kids are now mental health kids. They're DD kids. They're developmentally disabled. They, they are violent. They are severely autistic. And so we're all having to make a shift in Georgia to understand that for a long time, like every state in the nation, we took children into care that should have never gone into care. We took children into care because the communities weren't caring for them. They had nowhere to live. Uh, they didn't have a job. They didn't have any money to pay for gas, or they were all living in their car and the weather was cold. I'm guilty of that. Did it hurt? It absolutely hurt. But I didn't have anything, or I thought I didn't have anything else to use. So now what we've got to do is come in and look and say, okay, over here prevention-wise, this is a whole group of children that don't have to be in care. They might have defects or the agency touching them, but they don't have to be in care and really focus on how we're going to work with these kids that are very complex. That's going to take everybody laying down their egos, you know, everybody laying down what they believe is right because none of us really know. And really, go. I've always said we need to put them in a room, take their cell phones away from them, lock the doors and say, until you come up with a solution, you're not going to come out. Well, I've been told I can't do that. That's the judge thing in me is let's just do it that way. But I think we have the people in the state to do that. But it's, it's going to take some time and it's going to take a different kind of, of funding, a different kind of the, a way taking money from over here to spend it over here. We did that with accountability courts. You took money from corrections. And those guys said, you're not getting any of our money. And Governor Dill said, oh, yes, we are. And we took that money and we put it into having true treatment courts. And then they didn't have to go to corrections. So I think that in Georgia, we're, we're getting there. We got to keep working at it um, and, and we can do it, uh, you know, but it's going to take change in the way we think about it. Well, it is the grace 
to understand the fallacy of preconception. Exactly. And the admonition that we too often communicate to others that they should have an open mind. We yeah. need to embrace <laughs> yeah. the fact that we should have an open mind. Yeah. This has just been a wonderful discussion. Juanita Stadman, Executive Director of Together Georgia, Gwen Skinner, Vice President of Operations of Devereaux in Georgia. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you for sharing your understanding. And please thank your staff. Please thank your donors, your funders, your counterparts at the state, your counterparts in other nonprofits. And also thank the young people who mm. are being served and their families. They are part of the energy that creates your organizations and and that needs to be recognized. Everybody yeah. needs to be valued. And part of this is, is our own journey into valuing everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. It's been my pleasure.